In this lesson, lesson two deals with a farmer. And as you see in your, your, your handout, a farmer in God's harvest. So this metaphor is dealing with a farmer. So let me ask you, what is the harvest? What is the field that we're looking for a harvest from? Pardon? For the world? Lost? Souls, okay. And that's, that's good. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we want. We want to see, how are we going to see a harvest of souls? How are we going to see that? Planting seeds. There are certain things we need to do, don't we? And that's why this lesson is going to talk about the things of uh, what a farmer does to get things to happen. Now, some of y'all are really good gardeners. You know how to plant things. I plant things. I still, it just still doesn't work out right, you know. Some things just don't work out. But some of y'all are really good. You just got that green thumb, I guess. You just put it in. It just, just works, you know, for you. So, see, go, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. A little, a little too high. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, in this 2 Timothy chapter 2, even though it takes, your lesson takes the one text out of there, I want you to see, we're going to read this, this whole chapter. And I said, oh man, a whole chapter, I know. Bear with me. Just, just go through the whole chapter one time. And I want you to see something out of this chapter. Because when you, once you pull that verse out of there, you need to see, well, where the verse fit? Well, how did it fit back in there again? Okay, so I want you to see the whole chapter here for chapter 2. When Paul wrote this to 2 Timothy. Even though our verse that we have for our text is chapter 2, verse 6, the husbandmen that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. So let's see how that fits back into the chapter. So in this chapter, Paul says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. If a man also strive for mastery, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore endure all things for the elect's sake, that thou may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for, it be, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they, they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they are all increased into more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doeth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that this resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and yet and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are, there are not only vessels of gold and silver and also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some of dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he should be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and met for the master's use, and, preserved, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do generate strife, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preventure will give them repentance to acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captivity by him at his will. 
Now I know it's a lengthy chapter and I read a lot to you, but as you're reading through it, did you see anything? We're gonna talk about the husbandman, but there's some other metaphors in this thing that Paul's addressing as well. The husbandman is just one of those he brings out. Did you see in the other metaphors? How does he liken the Christian believer? In verse, verse one, what does he call Timothy? My son. Verse two, how is he referred to? Not so much as to, for us for Timothy, but what is he referring to? Being a teacher, teaching, being able to teach others. Verse three through four, what do you see? Soldier, be a good soldier. Verse five, now that one you don't, you have to look at a little closer, but it's striving, talk about striving for the mastery. Athletes, those who strive, who work hard to be, uh, run marathons, whatever it might be, they strive to, at, the, at that. Verse six is the one we're dealing with, the husbandman, because he says in verse six. Verses, chapter two, verses 15, Go down a little bit further. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A what? A workman. To be a workman. Going down in verse 20 through 23, he says, what? I know there's a lot of questions first thing in the morning. On a Sunday morning. Vessel. Being a vessel. I love this verse. I've always have loved this verse. Being a vessel meant for the master's use. And then verses 24 through 26, what is he referring to? A servant. So in here, he brings out these different metaphors about a Christian, what they're supposed to be. He's talking about Timothy. This is the things that you need to think about. And to do these things, you need to be these things. You need to be a son. You're my son. You need to be a teacher. You need to be a soldier, an athlete. Just like these things, he brings out these different metaphors. Now, keep in mind in our book that we're going through, that you've got our lessons, the metaphors we're going to do. Today, we're doing the husbandman. But if you notice, chapter, lesson number three is going to deal with a workman. Lesson number three in our book is the workman. He takes it right out of here. And then lesson number four talks about the soldier. And it comes right out of here. So Paul takes some of the, these metaphors right here. This book, this, this writer, this uh, Sunday school lesson we're dealing with, pulls them right out of this, these metaphors right here. But what I'm trying to get you to understand that when Paul wrote this, he's trying to tell Timothy, think about in these terms as a soldier, as an athlete, as a husbandman. These, you try to apply that to your life. So as a husbandman, what do you do as a husband? Or a farmer, as we're used to calling. So that's what we're gonna to learn today. What does a farmer do to do what? Does farmer make machinery? Does he sit down and he works in the office and works in the factory? Is that what a farmer does? Tends to his crops, Tends to his crops doesn't he? He works in the field. He works in that kind, that's where he labors at differently. A soldier doesn't do that. Does he? Back then, a soldier didn't do that. That's what, the, that's what the farmers did. The soldiers had their own jobs. The athletes did his own thing, right? The, uh, a vessel, being a vessel meant for the master, a servant did something different. But here we're going to talk about the farmer, what he does. So for the farmer to, to accomplish his task, what are his tasks that he has to do? You already mentioned earlier, he has to do what? He has to plant seed. Now, have y'all ever plant seeds before? Grass seed. You just walk out there, just throw them out there. Boy, they're, come on up, buddy. Come on, keep coming up. And some of them just don't come up, do they? Got to prepare the soil. Now, this past spring, man, this fall, I tilled up a good part of my yard to get rid of some stuff. And I put some grass seed out there. It took some, took some, work, some work to do this thing. The grass is coming up good. It looks good right now. Hopefully, it stays good. But there's no guarantee with it. I have to pamper it. I have to look after it. You know, all that kind of stuff. You know how it works. So, <clears throat> what are the tasks of a farmer has to do in order to get a harvest? He's got to prepare the soil, does he not? So, bullet one, I think you got the farmer prepares. I think it's that, your little blank there, if that's what you're looking for. So, look in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. Verses 6 through 9. Let's get over here. He spake also this parable. A certain man that had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. 
Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none, but cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and it and if it bear if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So what is this parable addressing here? I mean, I know it's a parable, but just from the aspect of this, the, the person, the owner of the land of, of this place says, I come by this fig tree, and I've come by it how many times? Just last week. And he said, for three years, I keep coming by, and it does what? Nothing. Why is this thing taking up ground? Why is it taking up space here? And what did the caretaker said? Let me work with it. Give me one more year. He said, and he's answering, said, let alone this year also till I dig about it. I got to prepare the soil around it. And I'm going to put dung. In other words, I'm going to put fertilizer around that tree and see if that will help it. And that's what's involved in this. So if we're going to be, remember I go back to this thing. What is our field? What is our field? The world, the world is our field. So how are we going to, what are we going to do about reaching the world? Reaching others, our neighborhoods, the people around us. We got to, okay, we got to plant the seed. And also with planting the seed, you got to work with people, don't you? You got to work with them a little bit. You got to develop. I don't know if you remember when David Gates was here with us, our, our missionary to, well, it was to Egypt, now he's going to Michigan. And that's what he said, developing relationships with people. You know, that's what the key in Egypt with him having to develop these relationships with them. So, in helping prepare in this, what's the one first thing you have to do? You've got to clear your bullet. I think your lesson says A is, is clearing. You're clearing what? You've got to do a clear, you got to clear the land, get it ready. I don't know about you, when I had to till that up, I'd do some clearing out some stuff to get that piece of property straightened out. Clearing it out. Now, look in Isaiah chapter 5, well, I think it's in your book, Isaiah 5 2. Some of these passages I know are written down. Isaiah 5 2. And he fenced it in and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. When you're preparing the land or property, you know, like you're planting a garden, isn't that what you do? You till it up, straighten it out, but you have to get what? You gotta get, if you've got rocks in the way, you don't want to till over top of rocks. You've got to get the land right. Getting those things out of the way. You've got to get the stuff that's out of the way. Now, I know we're talking about, we think in the mindset of just the harvest is what? Now, I know I've laid the kind of groundwork here for you, and that's your mindset. But what are you thinking the harvest is all about? Winning souls. But the, back it up a little bit. The other part of the harvest is something else. It's us. We are to be vessels meant for the master's use. I love that verse. But to do that, to be the right kind of farmer, we got to be the right kind of farmer. we got to be right. And if you read through, when we read through 2 Timothy, all these things that Paul talked about for Timothy is also talking about him as a person. Not what you're just going to do, but you as a person. Are you got that right relationship with the Lord? Do we have that right relationship? So there's some things, maybe there's some things we've got to clear out of our lives. You know, get that stuff cleared out of our own lives. Do we have stuff in our lives that hinders us? I mean, what do you think preachers do? They preach to us to do what? To make a buck? Make some money off of us? What are they trying to do? They're trying to help us to grow and to be soul winners. In order to be soul winners, to be witnesses, you got to prepare your own heart. You got to be a vessel meant for the master's use. You got to be right. You got to be that soldier. There's things you got to deal with. Just like Timothy says, and Paul says in 2 Timothy. Maybe I'm not making sense. I hope I'm pulling this together for you to make sense. But this thing about being a farmer, yeah, I got to do what? It's in my own life. I've got to clear things out of my own life too. In um, 2 Kings chapter 18, you might want to turn there because I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Whoop. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. 
And he reigned 20 and nine years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name also was Abia, Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. Now, keep in mind, this is a young man, 25 years old. I'm looking around this room. Do, 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 do. I don't see anybody could be possibly in that room. I don't think so. Put your hands down. <laughs> Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth back there. Here's a young man, think about it, 25 years old, becomes the king. And what does he do? He says, the Bible says that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days, children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, of it, Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. And he clave to the Lord and, and departed not from the following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. I'm going to stop right there. So what did King Hezekiah do? When he became king, he did what? To his kingdom. He cleaned it up. As a leader, he cleaned it up. He took charge and said, we're going to get this stuff cleaned up. There was a king ahead of him. There was a couple of kings ahead of him, but they let things go to pot. And the idolatry and everything else went the pieces there. And what did it do to the nation Israel? It affected them. So King Hezekiah, he did what? Not just say, look what I did. That's not what he did it for. What did he do it for? He wanted to walk with the Lord. His heart was to walk with the Lord is what he wanted to do. And he wanted his land. He, he wanted this. God, and he, he, this is God's land. This is God's people. And I want God's people to do what's right. So he went in there and had they got rid of these things, got rid of these groves and these things, this idolatry, the stuff that was in the land that should not be in there. And he purposely did what? He cleared the land, in a sense, like a farmer. Got those hindrances out of the way. I mean, he can, he can talk blue in his face, but if you don't get rid of that stuff, it's still going to affect those people, aren't they? So, so, so say, if, say if he didn't clear it out of the land. And he just says, y'all need to get right with the Lord. But over here is all this grove and all this idolatry and stuff going on. This brazen serpent. Oh, this group over there still worshiping this serpent. And they said, okay, we hear you, Hezekiah. He said, no, we're getting rid of this stuff. And he cleared the land. And what happened? The Lord blessed him. Because he had a desire to serve the Lord and do what's right. So he had to clear the land. So what needs to be done done bef what needs to be done in our own lives this is my question myself to us but what needs to be done in our own is there something in our lives that has to be cleared out you know to get this land right you know in our own hearts and lives I know we're looking at the field to win souls okay but we got to work with this farmer here first so what do I got to do in my life to make sure I'm the right kind of vessel the right kind of person serving the Lord what, what do I have to clear out of my life so what do you got to clear out of your life that's hindering you from serving the Lord so think about that. So what's another thing a farmer has to do? Plowing. He has to plow, doesn't he? I gotta clear the land, get all these rocks and things and stumps out of the way, but then I gotta plow the land. Gotta break up the soil, don't we? In 1837, there was this guy. He was an inventor. He was a blacksmith, he was an inventor. And he invented something that really made a difference to farming. You know who this guy was? And what he invented? The plow. The steel plow. John Deere invented a steel plow because they found there in the Midwest when he moved in Illinois, when there were other plows, the clay and all that was sticking to the plow that they were using. And so they had the farmers had to stop and clean the plow back off. But he designed a plow that it was self-cleaning and it broke up the ground better. And it made the job easier for the plumber, uh, farmers there. In Vermont, where he was born at, they put on the, the plaque there, the, plow, the inventor of the plow that broke the plains. And it did. It revolutionized how farmers did things. Can you imagine, as a farmer, you're trying to get the land ready, and you got this, now you got an instrument that helps you to do it better. So a farmer has to have, be able to be plowing the land up. 
I know he's talking about sowing the seed, but you've got to plow the land up too. Jeremiah 4.3 says, I think that's in your book. I think that's in your notes there. Jeremiah 4.3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Hosea 10.12 says, break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord. Now for all you farmers and planters and gardeners we got in this room, you got to break the ground up, don't you? Put that seed in there. The seed doesn't do too good sitting on top of the ground, does it? It just doesn't work too well. My, my little thing's not big enough. I got all these things laid out here trying to see everything. I say, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. I don't know if that's in your book or not. I don't remember. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. I'm talking about the Word of God. Hebrews 4, 2. Four two. No, it wasn't four. It's four twelve. I'm sorry, four twelve. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul, soul and spirit, and of the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and as is discerned the thoughts and intents of the of the heart. So, what can break up the fallow ground in our hearts? Is the word of God. And being under the preaching of the Word of God and hearing godly preaching will make a difference. And, and for us to take time and read the Word of God, not just, all right, I'm here Sunday and I'm, you know, I've read the book, okay, let's go on. But during each day, opening up God's Word and letting God's Word work on our hearts. The, the, the author of this is a study lesson, I think it's a good idea, having a reading schedule, a Bible reading schedule, that having that laid out for you well, it might help you, some people. I wasn't able to print any out because my computer is not available right this minute, but I was going to do that. But having a reading schedule for the next year might help. But the idea is to be what? Be in God's Word every day. Because God's Word is going to do what? Like it says here, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and as a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Isn't it amazing when people bring up ideas and thoughts, but they bring it up from their selves sometimes. They're not thinking, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? The Bible is what's important, you know? All your thought process and all that should be about, what does the Bible say? We're getting back to that. Because the Bible is what's going to make a difference. The Bible is what's going to be like, the, is, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edges. So it's going to break up the ground. You try to witness to somebody without the Word of God. Is it going to work? It's not going to work. You can be flowery words and try to convince them however you want to convince them, but without the Word of God, you need the Word of God to do it. Because the Word of God is going to work on their heart. And that's what the Holy Spirit is going to use the Word of God to work in their hearts. So, what's the next thing the farmer does? I think he got the ground cleared, he got it, he got it broken up, and he looks at it. All right, plants, let's work on it. Let's come on up. You got to do what? You got to plant. The farmer has to plant, doesn't he? So what is he going to plant? What's he going to plant? The good seed. He wants to plant a good seed, don't he? Now, when I'm, I don't know about you, when I'm getting grass seed, I kind of like to get a good grass seed. Because, you know, you look through this package, and oh, man, it's got a bunch of weed in this thing. I don't want that. I'm, the whole idea is to get rid of the weeds. Not sit there and put them back in the ground again. But you want a good seed, don't you? So what is a good seed that we need to be planting. The Word of God. Amen. So Haggai 2.19 says, if you have, let's see if that's in your... Haggai 2.19 Oh, I jumped past where I wanted you to be, but I'll come back to it. Haggai 2.19 says, Is the seed yet in the barn? Are you, are you a barn? Are you like a barn? You got all this seed in you? And I got all this stuff about the Bible I know? but I don't want to share it with anybody? Think about it. Are you like a barn? I got all this good word of God that I know about. God's word I know, but I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to share it with them. 
I know this, but I'm not going to share it with them. Hosea here in the scripture says, he's asking, is the seed yet in the barn? What good is it doing in the barn? What is the seed doing in the barn? What good is it doing? Man, I know I'm mean. I'm mean on Sunday morning talking about this. But what is it doing in the barn? You're storing it up for what? You got to use it, don't you? You don't just store it there forever. And what is the seed? Back to First Peter. Was it First Peter? One twenty-three. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Being born again by the incorruptible word of God. If that, we just keep the seed in the barn. We're not sharing it with anybody else. What good is it doing? We got to get it out there. Luke chapter 8, verse 5. Y'all know this one. Luke chapter 8, verse 5. Luke chapter 8, verse 5. And go down there. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the side. The wayside. And it was trodden down, and the, the fowls of the air devoured it and some fell upon a rock and as as soon as it was sprung up it withered away because it lacked moisture and stuff fell among thorns and, and the thorns sprang up and with it and choked it so when you plant this seed you got to be careful where you're planting it don't you but you got to do what you got to be actively planting the seed yeah i got a lot of seed it's in that bag right there Whew. see that field that's where i want you to get to that bag's just going to sit there, isn't it? The bag's not moving with all that seed sitting in it. I, as a farmer, I, as the sower, have to do that. I have to physically put it out there. It's just common sense, isn't it? But same thing with the Word of God. We've got to get it out there to other people. But you know what? In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4, and I, where's that? I, didn't, I don't think that was here. I thought I saw it somewhere. Ecclesiastes 11, 4. Let me turn it. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. Think about that. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. Why? It's real windy out here today. I guess I better not plant. Whoa. And it's so easy to do. Mike and I were talking, to, uh, he was sharing with me about hunting and about how windy it was that day. And I thought it was interesting. Those guys didn't show up because it was too windy for them. And what did you do, Mike? You got you a deer, didn't you? That's right. He didn't let that wind stop him. Don't let the circumstances around you hinder you in sowing the Word of God. I, th- I just thought about that. You know, I was thinking about that when I studied it. We start, well, you know, I might offend them, you know, if I tell them something. You know, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't know about you, but their feelings might get hurt. But it's their soul that's important more than their feelings are. They've got to get past that point. We, I'm talking about we and myself as well. Each one of us have to get past that point. That those people have a soul that we have to reach. And not worry about the circumstances so much around us. We can, I don't know about you, we, we all do it. We all come, we come with excuses. Um, do, do you not, or you don't come with excuses? When you try to share the word of God, so you, you don't want, well, I, I don't want to say anything. I might say the wrong thing. I feel the same way. I feel like I, I could say the wrong thing. I can say the wrong thing. I know that. But if I at least share the word of God, I know that's the right thing to with them. My words may not be exactly right, but sharing the word of God, give them a track. The, the words are right there on the track to help them out. But if we let the circumstances around us affect us, and we come up with all the excuses, and I can't do anything, what are we doing? I know it's a tough, this is a tough lesson. General, George, General Stonewall Jackson said, the duty is ours. The consequences are God's. Doing what's right first. And let God take care of what has to be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I'm going to turn there myself. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. 
Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Let me ask you this, what did Paul plant? What was Paul planting? He said, I have planted, but Paul, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. What was he planting? He was planting the word of God. Wherever he went, he was witnessing to people. He was planting the word of God. I think too in my own self as well, okay, you share the gospel with somebody, you just see nothing happening. It's like, okay, I, I guess I didn't do it right. I didn't say it right. I didn't, well, well, it had something to do with me. Maybe, maybe not. But you don't know what you planted that Brother Bryson comes along, happens to be talking to this, you don't even know each other. And Brother Bryson happens to meet this guy and says something to him about the Lord again. Starting to water that seed that this guy has heard. You don't know who's wa- helping to water the seed along the way. You may be helping to water the seed that somebody else gave. But Paul's doing what? He's planted the word of God. And how did he plant it? He preached it. He preached it. He lived it. The testimony he carried. He endured a lot, didn't he? And we've done the life of Paul. Yeah. And I learned a lot from the life of Paul when I was going through. I don't know if y'all did, but I, I learned a lot from that. But what Paul had to go through and still stick with it no matter what. So what's another thing a farmer has to do? He has to do pruning. Pruning is not easy. Pruning the crops. Pruning. So what does that mean to prune the crops? Y'all have, we have blackberries. We have blackberries. My wife's got into blackberries. We got blackberry bushes. Brother, what is it? Yeah, that's right. And even on these blackberry bushes we've been trying to work with, there's certain times you got to go out there and kind of start clipping off some of the branches that are no good to you. Yeah, to get the thing to produce right. Y'all have some other plants that you probably have to do some pruning to, to get them to produce right. But it does what? It clears up things. It's taking care of the plant. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, if you would, please. I don't know if that's Sarah, but it says, uh, what was that? About 13. Oop, go over. Matthew 13. 13, verse 7. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked it. But others fell upon, uh, into, into good ground. But verse 7 talks about falling among the thorns. Getting rid of those thorns, getting the thorns out of the way. When you're planting and you got other things coming, when you got a garden growing, or whatever you got growing there, you got what else showing up in there with you? We, where did these things come from? I know I didn't plant them, but they showed up somehow. Of all things, and they'll grow like crazy. You know, you're trying to grow, I get back to this grass thing. I'm trying to grow grass. And where does these weeds come from? These guys go crazy in there. But it's the grass I want to grow, not the weeds. So I got to do some cleaning out, don't I? I got to do some pruning out of that. But what about in our own lives? What in our own lives is affecting how we are being a witness to other people? What, what little pruning has to be done in our own lives? Do we like pruning? I don't know about you. When you're out there pruning off those blackberry uh, bushes there, you got those little clippers. Get that thing right off of there, you know? Cut them right off. Do some cutting, some serious stuff. It doesn't grow back again, right? You know, that branch is gone. Part of the pruning is what? Getting rid of stuff is no good. It's not easy sometimes, isn't it? It's not always easy. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. John chapter, yeah, 15, 1 through 3. John chapter 15, 1 through 3. I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now stop there. Every branch, he says what? Verse 2. Every branch that beareth fruit, he just lets it go. He purges it. Yes. Right. He said, I'm producing fruit, Lord. Why is these things happen to me? He's got to do some pruning. Pru- pr- purging, I guess you want to call it the purging. Pr- Pruning here, purging. He's purged it, that it may bring what? More fruit. Think about it. I never thought in that term, but you know, he, got a, he got a plant that's really producing, but he's, I got to clip this off. I got to clip that off and clip this off to get it to produce better. 
It does. It takes care. It's taking care of the crops. So the last bullet, I think you got the number three. The farmer, what? He possesses. He possesses what? He's done all this work and he's got this, this field laid out and he's doing all this good stuff. And I know this is a, a metaphor explaining that way to, about life, about a, metaphor, about, a, about a farmer. He's done all this planting. And his, the, so now you want what? You want a harvest to show up, don't you? So the time now is to harvest. The time, your number A under your bullet. The time now is, the, the time to harvest is now. John chapter 4, verse 35. Very familiar verse. To, verse 35. Well, let's go to verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth, receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto, his, unto, unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that wherein you bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. He says what? The fields are already white to harvest. You don't have to wait. It's always available. It's always there. People, souls are ready to be saved. We just got to be the right kind of vessel, the right kind of farmer, the right kind of one developing the relationship with those people and, and to reaching and sharing the gospel, planting the good seed, not keeping the seed in the barn. You know? Let me ask you something. What happens... Your crops are coming up. You say, whatever you're growing. What are you growing up? It looks good. Boy, they look good. But you don't harvest them. What happens to them? They rot. It just rots. So the field out there is ready to be harvested. And if we don't witness to them, what happens to them? They're going to die. They're going to die, aren't they? So we have to have a burden for their souls to reach out to them. To get them while we can. You know, just like this, we're so concerned about our tomato plants. I better get those tomatoes off. Well, they're going to rot. I better get them off there. But what about the souls out there? We need to be, in our, in our own lives, if we, don't, we need to get stuff cleaned out of our own lives so we can be, be the right kind of vessels, the testimony for the Lord. So the time of, each, the time of harvest brings what? When you Think about it. When, you, when you're growing crops, say you're growing whatever you're growing. you got tomatoes. Oh, you come in the house. Look, honey, look what I got. These tomatoes, well, these are great looking tomatoes. What are you doing? You're happy about it, aren't you? You're excited that you've got things coming off what you've been working on. Same thing about winning others to the Lord. Rejoicing that, hey, somebody else got saved, you know? And that's the way it should be with us, you know? Proverbs 13, verse 19. I think that's written in your, your thing here. Uh, I get my pages over here. The desire to accomplish is sweet to the soul. The desire, what was the desire? The desire was what? To plant and to see a harvest come in. And when the harvest comes in, you're excited. You're, this is great. This is wonderful. This is what I wanted. I got rid of the weeds. I got rid of all this other junk. I got really what I wanted here. You're excited about it. We're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving this week, of course. And it's just, it's just interesting how this lesson just happens to be on this timing of this, the Thanksgiving. So when we have Thanksgiving, what do we normally do? What, what's our first thought? Food. Yes, food. That's all we say, food. And who's fixing the food, you know? So-and-so is fixing this. And so, you know, let's sit down at this table, we eat all this food, and then after that we say, oh, I ate too much. Oh, this is miserable. But there's more on the table. But we'd be thanking the Lord that we've had his kindness, his grace, his mercy in our lives to allow us to sit down with family again. Sometimes when we have these family get-togethers, there's somebody who's not there anymore. You know, it's not the same anymore like it used to be. That's, you know, our family has changed over time, you know, with the passing of my mom and the passing of my mother-in-law because we had a, we had a thing going, you know, like... Thursday, Thanksgiving Day was a rush day. You either have Thanksgiving at her house first and you run over to my mom's house in the evening. Next year, it's the other way around. We run over to my mom's house first and then we run over to my mother-in-law's in the evening. 
So we're really stuffed. But both of them are in heaven now. So our thanksgivings are different. But what about us now at our thanksgiving that we're having together? We're going to meet with family, some friends, whatever we might have this time around. But being able to thank the Lord for what he's done, his grace, his mercy, his kindness in our lives. And how he's blessed us in so many ways. And hopefully we can be able to share the gospel with somebody. Maybe plant a seed, even at Thanksgiving time. Maybe, let, maybe uh, get a little harvest off of Thanksgiving at this time. Celebrating is at Thanksgiving time. And that's the way it should be. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that, you la your, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, going back to sharing the gospel with somebody and witnessing, and they don't get saved. And then what do you do? Man, I blew it. I messed up. I must have messed up. I must have said something wrong to them. I don't know what it is. And they say, well, I'm afraid to talk to the next person. Or the next person. You know, I, might, I might mess up again. Paul says what? Stick with it. Keep sticking with it. Stick with it right there. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because why? You're doing it when? In the name of the Lord. Now, if you're doing it for yourself, say, hey, man, look how great I am. I am out there. Man, I'm beating on the road out there, knocking on doors. Man, I'm just doing 100 doors a day. No, no, no. It's not about you. It's not about you or me. It's about the Lord and putting the Lord out there. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, I told to you earlier about, we think about the harvest deals with the field out there, souls being saved. But it's also about our lives too. And back it up again, to our lives as well. We need to do some pruning. We need to do some cleaning out of our lives. Because if we do, and we plant the good seed, what's the good seed? The Word of God in our own lives. Is it going to make a difference in our lives? Is it going to create a different harvest in our hearts and lives? It is. It will make a difference in our lives. So we'll be better farmers in the Lord. We'll be better husbandmen. Be better vessels. So we can look out there and see the field is white under harvest. And the field is, needs to be. And we can do those things to help the others. Now if you turn back to 2 Kings. Back to 2 Kings chapter 18. To wrap this up. What did Hezekiah do? Again. What did he do? 25 years old. He does what? Becomes king and he does what? I hear a little. He clears up the land of the idols. The things that were hindering the people. And the nation. That's right. So the last verse. And I left this verse off for you. But if you look at verses, I, I read this verse 6 to you, but he says, For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him. Keep that in mind. Just like Paul said, stay steadfast. Stay at it. Keep following the Lord. Stay with it. And he says, verse 6, For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And what does it say in verse 7? And the Lord was with him. And he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. What did it do for King Hezekiah? He made the Lord. Isn't that great? The Lord is with him. And the Lord made him prosper in whatever he did. And he was also able to stand up against the Assyrians as well. Not because of, look at me, I'm the king, Hezekiah, and I'm the greatest king around. No, that's not what it was about. His thing was first was about he had his eyes on the Lord. And that's what he, he wanted to serve. And that's who he wanted honored first. And he honored the Lord first. And he did what was right. Was it easy clearing out the land? You think it was really easy? All right, I want all you soldiers down here to start clearing this place out, you know. These people knew some of those people. Probably family members. What they had to deal with. You think he got a lot of grief over that too? Probably did. But he cleared out the land. And it helped them. 
He trusted in the Lord of God of Israel so that after him was none king like, like unto him. Verse 5. Among all the kings of Judah, nor any before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded him, Moses. And the Lord was with him. I think that's so great. The Lord was with him. Didn't say that earlier, but it says it now. So what about in our lives? Are we going to be good husbandmen? Are we going to be good farmers? Or we say, hmm, I'm going to keep that seed in the barn a little longer. And I share it. Any comments, any questions? I heard the first bell, so I'm trying to wrap up. Kind of quiet. Just wait until Pastor Monteith gets up here. Woo! He'll whip you in, he'll whip you in the shape. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, what you hang around with. Yep, and that's the thing, and that's the whole thing. Knowing what the Word of God says to apply it to our lives, in all things. Any comments? Any questions? Hopefully, we learn something. And next week, um, I'm out of town, of course, in. Uh, Brother Bob Cycle knows, so I don't know what he's what he's planning on. Who he's having in here for you. So, and then the week after, Lord willing, we'll pick up again on the next lesson for you. Any comments? Any questions? All right, we'll go to Lord in prayer and we'll be dismissed.